Hello everyone, welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. We're in 2 Chronicles chapter 32. We resume our study in verse 20. 2 Chronicles 32 verse 20. Give you a minute to get your Bible. In the meantime, I'll tell you about the Scripture Verse by Verse website. You can study the entire Bible, whatever, whatever book you want to study. There's so much to choose from. God has given us 66 books from Genesis through Revelation, and you can study any one of them anytime you want at thebibleversebyverse.com, just the way we're going to do it today using my audio Bible messages. All you need to do is bring your Bible, have it open to whatever book you want to study, and click and listen, and we'll go through the Bible together. That's at thebibleversebyverse.com. Father, today we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Judah is being attacked. God's people, and they have been his faithful people, are being attacked by the world's superpower, a vicious group of people known as the Assyrians, who have already conquered the north, northern kingdom of Israel. And now they have, and they've, they've conquered a couple of cities in the south, and now they set their sights on Jerusalem, and they plan on doing that too. And they're surrounding Jerusalem. They've, they've laid siege, and letting, no one's coming in, no one's getting out. And... Then they, then they started talking smart. And they talked against uh, King Hezekiah, trying to turn the people against their king. But then they really stepped over the line and they started talking against God. They said, you know, your God isn't going to be able to protect you from us. None of the other gods in any of the other countries were able to protect their people. And that was a serious, fatal mistake. They equated Almighty God with other so-called gods, which aren't even real. There's only one God. God doesn't take kindly to that. So, Hezekiah's back is up against the wall. And he does what godly people do when that is the case. Verse 20. And for this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah the son of Amos, prayed and cried to heaven. Well, what a dynamite duel there. You got Hezekiah, great king, godly man, and Isaiah, one of the greatest prophets who ever lived. And they're praying. And how fortunate Judah was to have two men like this on their side during this crisis. Hezekiah, very godly king. Isaiah, one of the greatest prophets ever, as I said. And they're praying. And you know God's going to hear this prayer. Look at 21. And the Lord sent an angel who cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and the captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land. And when he was come into the house of his God, they who came forth of his own loins slew him there with the sword. So big shot, big mouth, Hezekiah was killed by his own children. <laughs> and of all places, the house of his precious God that he thought was so much tougher than Almighty God. Do you know the king of Assyria mocked God? And that's why God sent an angel, just one angel, and we know from elsewhere in Scripture, one angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. 185,000 of the toughest men on earth killed by one angel. And as a result, the king went home humiliated and he was murdered. Verse 22. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, 
the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them on every side. Whenever you doubt the power of prayer, this would be a real good section of scripture to read. The people prayed, God heard, he answered right away and gave them their heart's desire. That is the power of prayer. That's the prayer of a righteous person, though, see? Moses, I should say Isaiah, and Hezekiah were spiritual dynamite. They were so close to God. And before, before their words were even on their lips, God heard their prayers. That's what the Bible says. The Bible teaches. The Bible also says that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous person avails much. So many good reasons to say no to sin. To slam the door on temptation no matter how powerful it is. And one of these days you're going to get in a bind. And you're going to be in trouble. And if you're not walking with the Lord, you may not even think about turning to Him. Because your heart may be cold as ice because of all the sin you've committed. That may be the problem. That may be the issue. But even if you think of it, if you're not walking with the Lord, your prayer will not be heard. If you're not saved, your prayer will not be heard. Verse 23. And many brought gifts unto the Lord to Jerusalem and presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was magnified in the sight of all nations from that time forward. So the superpower Assyria was defeated by Hezekiah's God. And the word spread. The world may not respect God's holiness, but they will often respect his power. And so the nations respected King Hezekiah because of his God. 24. In those days, Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord, and he spoke unto him, and he gave him a sign. And the sign, we know again from elsewhere in Scripture, was the shadow of the sundial went backwards 10 degrees. <laughs> How about that? The sun reversed itself. Actually, I suppose the earth stopped rotating and went backwards for a while. God put the brakes on inertia and started the earth to spin just a little bit, gave it a little little push, went back 10 degrees. That was his sign that God was going to heal him of this deadly disease that God, first of all, said was going to kill him. Verse 25, but Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore, there was wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. And Hezekiah lapsed into pride for a short period of time. And that's the sin that was spoken of here. 26, notwithstanding Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon him or came not upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Good people who love God sin. You know, when you commit a sin, it's, it's a terrible thing. But even if you love God, you're going to at times commit sin. You're not walking in love when you do that, but... Nevertheless, it happens. The difference is, like with Hezekiah, God's people, who truly love him, feel like dirt. They feel horrible. They can't live with themselves. So they immediately repent and they immediately confess their sin. And just notice how willing God was to show mercy once he saw that Hezekiah 
really repented. Notice 27. And Hezekiah had very great riches and honor. And he made himself treasures for silver and for gold and for precious stones and for spices and for shields and for all manner of costly articles, storehouses also, for the increase of grain and wine and oil and stalls for all manner of beast and coats for flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much substance. And the lesson from these verses is this. God blesses those who are close to him. God blesses those who are close to him. He may not bless them with material things, but he will bless them in some way. Verse 30, this same Hezekiah also stopped the upper water course of Gihon and brought it straight down to the west side of the city of David. And Hezekiah prospered in all his works. He brought water into Jerusalem through underground channels. 31, howbeit in the business of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. God tested Hezekiah's faith. He had an opportunity to give, all, give God all the credit for all his wealth, but he didn't. 32. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his goodness, behold, they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, and in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. So if you want more on the life of Hezekiah, the book of Second Kings is the one to read. 33. And Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the chiefest of the sepulchres of the sons of David. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem did him honor at his death. And Manasseh his son reigned in his stead. Hezekiah, one of the godliest rulers in Israel's history, unfortunately is followed by one of the worst, his son Manasseh. Let's go into chapter 33. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. Manasseh was the very evil son of the very godly Hezekiah, which just goes to show that you can live for Jesus today, and you can teach your children the right way, but they still have a free will, and sometimes they choose to turn their back on God and go the opposite direction for whatever reason. Verse 2. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. He rejected God and lived like the devil. And in fact, According to historical records, he had the prophet Isaiah sawn in, sawn in two. That's how much he hated the word of God and holiness. Three, for he built again the high places which Hezekiah, his father, had broken down. And he reared up altars for Balaam and made idols and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He undid all the good that his father did. Manasseh worshiped false gods, false things, instead of the God who made all things. Verse four, also he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord had said in Jerusalem, shall my name be forever. And he built altars for all the host of heaven 
in the two courts of the house of the Lord. The holy temple that had been built and consecrated to the service and worship of God was now being used for false gods, including the false religion of astrology. Six, and he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also, he observed times and used enchantments and practiced sorcery and dealt with the medium and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. He sacrificed his own children to the god Moloch. He was involved in all sorts of occult. Let's just put it this way. If it was bad, if it was an abomination to God, he did it and he promoted it. If it was holiness, if it was holiness, if it had anything to do with the one true God, he rejected it. Seven. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribe of Israel, will I put my name forever. Putting a statue of a false god in God's temple was an unbelievable insult to God. Manasseh was just as bad as anyone could possibly be. Verse 8, Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for them. Well, let's read 7 along with it. And he set a carved image, the idol which he had made in the house of God, of which God had said to David and to Solomon, his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers. If only, if only they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them, according to the whole law and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. God's promises to his people were conditional. If they obeyed and served him, then he would bless. And he proved several times that he could be trusted to do that. That's why it's so important for us to offer God every morning and even throughout the day a sacrifice of righteousness. And put your trust in him because no one who puts, your tr puts their trust in God will ever be put to shame. But sometimes it is a sacrifice of righteousness because that temptation to sin can be very tough. So you sacrifice what your sin nature wants and you offer God that sacrifice of righteousness and you put your trust in him and he's going to come through for you. I'm not saying he's going to give you riches and wealth in this world, but he's going to give you something more important. And that's peace with God. He'll supply all your needs if you put him first. And most of the time, much, much more than that. Verse 9. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Um, that's bad. Boy, God had destroyed the heathen who had occupied the Holy Land before he gave it to Israel. He destroyed them for less evil than Manasseh did. Boy, he's pushing God way over the edge. It's like he's daring God to punish him. Never want to play a game of chicken with God. Because he's not going to flinch. But you're going to be destroyed. 10. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. So, you know, God would have been fully justified just to kill Manasseh on the spot, but he didn't do that. Spoke to him. 
spoke to him, gave him the word of God, tried to get him to wake up. He just would not wake up. Was not interested in it. They had done horrible things. And God graciously warned them to stop, but they did not stop. God usually warns before he punishes. If nothing else, you know right from wrong. And that's his warning. Verse 11. Wherefore, the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh in chains and bound him with fetters and carried him to Babylon for his sin and for his refusal to repent Manasseh is taken away to Babylon verse 12 and when he was in affliction he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him and he was entreated by him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. Amazing. Boy, don't give up on people. Don't give up on people that you're praying for because God is so powerful. He knows, how, he knows what buttons to push. He knows what levers to pull to get people to repent. Manasseh murdered innocent children. He murdered God's holy prophets. But when he repented, God forgave him and restored him as king of Judah. 14. Now after this, he built an outer wall for the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley, even to the entrance of the fish gate, and compassed about Ophel, and raised it up a very great height and put captains of war in all the fortified cities of Judah. He stopped doing foolish, ungodly things and he started doing productive things after he repented, correct things. Verse 15, And he took away the foreign gods and the idols out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. This is true repentance. He undid the idolatry things that he had done earlier. Good times did not make Manasseh repent and follow the Lord, but pain sure did. And he has completely changed. Notice verse 16. And he required, I should say, he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed on it peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. He did a 180 and tried to get the rest of the country to do the same thing. 17, nevertheless, the people did sacrifice still in the high places, yet unto the Lord their God only. Now, the people worshipped God, too, but it was sort of a, a mixed bag with the worship of false gods because it was done on the high places rather than in the holy temple alone. Verse 18, Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto his God and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, are they written in the book of the kings of Israel? Second Kings chapter 21 to be exact if you want to check it out in more detail 19 his prayer also and how God was entreated by him and all his sin and his trespass and the sites on which he built high places and set up idols and carved images before he was humbled behold they are written among the sayings of the seers verse 20 so Manasseh slept with his fathers and they buried him in his own house, and Ammon, his son, reigned in his stead. He repented, 
but he had been an evil influence on his son. And he couldn't undo that. The damage was done. 21. Ammon was two and 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh his father, for Ammon sacrificed unto all the carved images which Manasseh his father had made and served them. So Manasseh repented, but Ammon, his son, he just continued to worship the false gods. I guess his personality was sort of set in stone by his dad. And uh, he grew to love his sin and the sinful ways of his father and wasn't interested in the kind of repentance that his father displayed. Verse 23, probably thought his dad went off, off the deep end, you know, religiously. He, went off the, he became one of them religious people. All he could do is talk about God, talk about serving God, talk about doing what is right in the eyes of God. And didn't click with Ammon, probably turned him off, probably thought his dad lost his mind. Of course, there's always that possibility that you may ostracize friends and family members if you repent and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior, but that's the way it goes. You still owe it to God. And uh, to be frank, you owe it to yourself. Jesus himself said, if you don't love me more than your father, mother, son or daughter, husband or wife, sister or brother, you cannot be my disciple. You have to do what you know is right, and that's repent and receive Christ and live for him and trust him with how your family is going to result or react to it. And that's totally up to them. But you need to take care of your own soul. It's not going to do. It's not going to do you any good to be burning in hell alongside your family. You do the right thing. You set the example, and hopefully they follow or will eventually follow. But it's the right thing to do, and that's what trusting God is all about. Verse twenty-one. Ammon was two and twenty years old when he began to reign and reigned two years in Jerusalem. Again, verse 22. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh his father. For Ammon sacrificed unto all the carved images which Manasseh his father had made and served them, and humbled not himself before the Lord, as Manasseh his father had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more. And, and we see from this that our sins not only affect us, but they affect our loved ones, those who are closest to us. 24. And his servants conspired against him and slew him in his own house. Well, Ammon was not a very popular king, evidently, at least with some of his servants. And they rebelled against him and his authority, and they killed him. Murdered while he was in bed. 25. But the people of the land slew all those who had conspired against King Ammon, and the people of the land made Josiah his son king in his stead. Josiah was a good king, as we will see next time. And one of the first things he did was have his father's murderers executed. It's a crazy family, isn't it? Yep, sure is. We'll pick it up in chapter 34 next time. Until then, you can continue studying the Word of God if you want to at the thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the book you want to study. Click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it verse by verse. That's at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. Study the Word at your pace, at your convenience. Whatever you do, though, study the Word. It's the most important thing in the world. If the Word of God is a blessing to you, you appreciate this ministry of getting out the Word of God without compromise from Genesis to Revelation. You can be a part of this ministry. Please remember, we're not brought to you by any and under underwritten i should say by any large church or denomination but we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support which means i give out the word of god it's a faith ministry and i trust that god will move people who love his word to jump on board and become a part of this ministry you can give right there at the bible verse by verse dot, dot, dot com by clicking the donate button and prayerfully giving as the lord may lead 
Until next time, so long, everyone.